first of all, for being here and for inviting us to be here. This is quite an honor for us. We have already learned a lot while we've been here, so I hope that it, um, that you leave here feeling like you have learned a lot, too. Uh, my name is Lori Holbrook, and I am the Chief Clinical Officer for Avita Community Partners, and I'm going to spend some time near the end of the presentation telling you more about Avita Community Partners and what we do um, in North Georgia, but also what we do here in Blairsville and um, in, in Union County as well as in Towns County. So I'm going to introduce myself first. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, a few of the mental health disorders that are very prevalent in our, um, in our world, and uh, like major depression and bipolar, schizophrenia, and um, some information regarding suicide. And then I'm going to turn it over to uh, our clinical team lead, person in Blairsville who is Francesca Smith and she also covers Cleveland and uh, Dahlonega as well. So she's going to talk about substance use disorders a little bit and then we're going to kind of wrap it up talking about Avita and what that means for this community, how we can partner with you and many of you we have already partnered with and um, that's it's, it's exciting to hear about Peerview and what we can do together because we need each other. <laughs> and most of us in this room, we need each other because there's a population that, um, that sometimes doesn't know where to go. And we are their voice and we're their advocates. So I'm a licensed professional counselor and I started in the field in 1993. And um, seems like a really long time ago, and I've worked in outpatient centers. I've, I've worked with mental health and substance abuse, intensive outpatient. Um, I worked in the jail system while I uh, was in the, the uh, mental health field for uh, 19 years. I was uh, in several jail systems, so I worked with that population as well, and also a psychiatric inpatient facility. So at this point, my position as Chief Clinical Officer is to oversee the uh, mental health centers that we cover in Avita. Avita actually covers 13 counties in Northeast Georgia, and we have, we're the largest CSB in the state, which is a community service board. I apologize if I use acronyms, because we have a lot of different, as you probably do at the hospital, you can have an entire conversation and you never use a real word. <laughs> it's just like, uh, a community service board. So there are 25 of them in the state, and uh, we serve 13 counties, and we have 11 outpatient service sites and in our catchment area. And I can talk uh, a long time about that, but I'm going to wait, and I'm also going to try to move through some of these these disorders, I, I realize that in this room, we already have folks who have a lot of information about mental illness and about substance use disorders, but as, as you know, you may know, that a community survey uh, of a needs assessment was completed and to determine what the concerns were, what the high needs were in this area. And uh, in, the, in the top, did include mental health disorders and substance use disorders. And so that's why this partnership has happened and I, I'm very grateful for that. You know, Union County has really, uh, most recently, uh, I don't know a whole lot about the history, so I'm gonna say most recently, has really stepped up and took seriously the information that they heard about the needs assessment. You may know or may not know that um, Union and Towns County rank in the, within the top three for the highest number of suicides in the state of Georgia. And I was shocked by that, actually. I really was. But um, most recently, one of uh, the school system in Union County partnered with uh, VITA, and we, we sponsor a program called the Yellow Ribbon Campaign, and it is a suicide <coughs> Um, prevention program where we can help to educate uh, school personnel and then we provide a separate training to the some of the kids because what we find is that kids don't always turn to an adult when they're feeling suicidal they're going to turn to a friend <clears throat> so the idea is help to 
um, <coughs> me, help to give the other kids tools for what to do so that they can handle what is being presented to them. So um, Union County School took that very seriously and they had all of their employees, I believe there was 347 or somewhere around there, right, that were present, bus drivers, the lunchroom personnel chiefs, we were all invited because any of us could be in a situation where we recognize or we don't know that we are in a situation where we might not pick up on signs and symptoms of mental illness and substance use disorder. So um, that's, that's something that I, I think that as folks who live in this community, you should be aware of and be very proud of because they didn't have to do that. Not all school systems are doing that. As a matter of fact, we're in several other counties and those school systems are not doing that. So I think that that really speaks volumes to, to the school system here and the leadership. Um, so let me talk a little bit about major depressive disorder and bipolar disorder. Again, I could talk for a long time about it. It's kind of my thing. So I'm going to be very careful not to, to, to go too far with that. And then at the end, when we do complete all of these sort of components, we want to welcome any questions you have. Uh, we can stay and talk to you if you need us to do that. Uh, we did bring some brochures, so they are available to you as well. But I just want to talk a little bit about major depressive disorder. So we've all heard about people who are depressed, or you may know someone or have someone in your family who is depressed. And a clinical diagnosis of depression is different from someone who just has blues, you know, we all wake up some days and we just are like, <clears throat> it's just, you know, I don't know why, there's nothing really that, you know, nothing going on anymore than there was yesterday. There's just something about today. And then sometimes we wake up and we're like, oh, there's really a spring in my step. I really feel good today. Maybe it's because the rain has finally stopped. I don't know. But, you know, our brain gives us those doses of the, of the chemicals but since it's not an exact science, sometimes we get a little more dose and sometimes we get a little less dose. That is different. So major depressive disorder is a disorder that requires, um, there's a criteria around it, a time frame. It's not just <laughs> someone who is sad. And it is very debilitating. It really can impact the, um, what, statistically what we find is that employers find that this is the one disorder that impacts the workforce the most is depression because people don't really and there's still stigma around it nobody really kind of or people don't always want to admit that that's going on because of the judgment that goes along with that because again if you've not ever struggled with depression from a place of despair you are seeing it through your own lens, and there's kind of a, a belief that, well, you know, life was hard for me, too, and I cried a lot, too, and I got mad a lot, too, but, you know, I got up and went to work, and I went ahead and did the things I needed to do. So there's a little bit of a judgment there, believing that someone else should be able to do that, too, when, in fact, it can be quite debilitating. Um, the, the good news is that we are in the best place formal, pharmacologically we have been in, in, our, in our time with the medications that are available. There's a lot of different medications that are available, and you know, it's not an exact science. It would be great if we could take a blood test and say, um, yes, you have major depressive disorder, or you have bipolar disorder, and this is the medication, and this is the dose, and that's just not always possible, and so sometimes, People struggle because they'll say, I'm not feeling better. I don't feel better. And it takes time sometimes. And we want to encourage as people that are either working in the community or have folks in our own families or friends, we want to encourage them to not give up, to persevere. Continue to talk to your counselor or to your doctor and let them know what's going on because, again, there's this sense of, real shame sometimes I, uh, to continue to go back and not feeling better. Um, but there's also a component that sometimes people leave out, and that's counseling. And the medication can be super helpful. 
and counseling can be super helpful. But if you combine them, then your, you know, the, the, re, the resiliency, the recovery is so much more possible when a person combines those things and they are, um, they're supported. They're supported by their family, they're supported by their employer, they're supported by um, their church, they're supported by their uh, other community resources like the, the doctor's office or, or you know, just the people in our lives that we interact with, and we all do. So if you if you don't know someone, then you just don't know that person is struggling because there's someone in, in all of our lives that, that struggles with that because the prevalence is so high. I, um, I apologize. I am going to look at a couple things because there were some statistics that I wanted to share with you about... Um, about depression and about bipolar disorder. I'm going to talk a little bit about bipolar disorder now. And again, this is kind of, it's a general overview, okay? So we necess won't necessarily leave here being able to diagnose, but you'll have an idea if you are able to, you know, interact with someone. So we've heard a lot about bipolar disorder. It used to be called manic depressive disorder in, uh, back in the 70s and 80s. And, um, the, the term bipolar disorder really means two polar opposites. One side of the, the uh, pole is depression, and it is, again, serious depression, where there's often a component of suicidality there. And then the manic side, and manic is where you have um, an unusually amount of energy that keeps you from being able to maintain the areas of functioning in your life that you need to. For example, it, it's not when someone says, I have bipolar disorder, I get mad easy. Or I have bipolar disorder because I have mood swings. That's not what it is. It's much more um, uh, defined in the symptoms and how long it lasts for an individual. So some examples of folks that I've worked with who might be manic would be that they are, um, they'll say, I'm going to start a business. And they begin moving in a direction of starting a business and they're, they're unable to follow that through and so now they're going to start another business because that made me think of something else that I might want to do. Or I'm going to paint my house and they paint a wall, but they can't finish that wall, and then they don't finish the other walls because they're moving on to something else. Not sleeping for days, not just not being able to sleep, but not but, but for days not sleeping. And when you don't sleep for days, you will begin potentially to have symptoms of psychosis, like hallucinations, by hear and see things that other people don't hear or see. And that does not mean then that person is becoming. Uh, schizophrenic, uh, which is generally where you have hallucinations and delusions, but it is that your brain just can't maintain at that level. It's just not, we're not designed that way. Our brains need, need sleep and need rest. Let's see what else I want to say about that. So you might have um, changes in sleep, changes in appetite, uh, problems with concentration, um, with depression, you, you might see someone who just, it's easier to recognize, right? It's just easier to recognize. Although, some people do still put that face on the best they can and go to work and try to get through the day. But it is very, very emotionally very painful to do that. <coughs> All right, so I mentioned about the possibility of hallucinations. Um... For bipolar disorder, here's one of the uh, statistics I wanted to point out. It says every year, <coughs> bipolar disorder affects approximately 10 million adults in America. 10 million adults, which is a lot, and I'm not trying to minimize that number, but that is approximately 3% of the population. Now, when we hear about it, we often think that it's even a higher number than that. 10 million is a lot of people, but it's about 3% of our population. With, uh, with uh, depression, it's about 5% of the population. Let's see what I want to say to you about that. 
So symptoms of mania, um, needing less sleep to function, inflated self-esteem, talking fast, impulsive, easily distracted, jumping from one idea to another, um, hyper, um, spending money a lot. Um, a lot of divorces are often occur because of they, they're they related to overspending when it may be that that person may be doing that um, or running up bills and then not telling their spouse, that type of thing, because they're in possibly a manic state. And I have a quote from um, uh, a person who was in a manic state, and I'm borrowing a lot of the information on purpose from a training that NAMI supports, and it's a crisis intervention training, and it is for law enforcement. And the governor has committed that he wants all the law enforcement in the state to be CIT trained, crisis intervention team. And we have partnered with NAMI and with um, the Gypstick uh, Georgia Public Safety Training. I thought to say Gypstick. That's just not. <laughs> sort of sound like it. <laughs> so anyway, they, um, we have been providing training. It's a week-long intense training. So the, it, the law enforcement or 911 operator or um, a jail um, deputy would be able to identify, recognize, and understand how to engage someone who may be in a mental health crisis because they engage individuals and they might not know what they're walking in on, on the scene. So this is, again, not all states are doing this, but the governor really wants all law enforcement trained. So we have, we've been doing that all year. So I am borrowing from that because I know this information is tried and true. And this is the quote, for someone who is in a manic state, Life feels like it is supercharged with possibility. You're talkative and feel bold and powerful, attractive, charming and cunning, all at the same time. Ordinary activities are extraordinary. Supermarkets are temples with altars stacked with cereals and pastries, puddings and peanuts, milk and mayonnaise, everything you can eat or cook or paint or dance to. I don't know about you, but I have never been in a grocery store. <laughs> but, but you can see why someone might want to stay in that state of mind rather than the other polar side of that because this feels happy. I mean, this feels like whatever you do, you're going to enjoy it. And so many times if you know someone who has struggled with bipolar, they are not, they don't always adhere to their medications. Even though we say, you know, you should take your medicines, you should take your medicines. Well, if this feels like this, you take that medicine, it begins to bring that person down to what we might say is normal, but for them feels down. You're holding me down. I can't get these things done. I mean, I want to go where the supermarket is filled with. <laughs> it's like, I'm done. Uh, the other comment is, I become the energizer buddy on a supercharge. Why does everybody else need so much sleep, I wonder? I hastily finish next week's homework and write poetry late to the night. Hours pass like minutes and minutes like seconds. If I sleep, it is only briefly, and I wake refreshed thinking, this is going to be the best day of my life. Well, I don't feel like that. <laughs> so you can see that if a person maintains that high level of mania for so long, then it turns into something that is much more difficult to manage. And um, they would behave in ways they would never have behaved if they were not in a manic state. And I've seen that um, in individuals, and many of you probably have to. Um, I do want to also mention for bipolar, and then I'm going to mention as well in schizophrenia, what is interesting to me is that the diagnosis does not often come when a person is younger. It actually starts when they are in late teens. And for those of you in the room like me that have kids, you know, when you get your kids through high school, you're just like, you know, I've dodged a bullet kind of thing. But what happens is some of those symptoms begin to present themselves in a much more obvious way. They could have been there before, but, you know, for adolescents, sometimes it's hard to know. Is this person having 
a bipolar episode or are they a teenager, you know, because it can look a lot like the same oftentimes. Um, with the medications, what I want to say again about those medications, and this applies to all the disorders, as I mentioned before, someone might not want to take the medication. Some of the side effects of the medications can be very unpleasant. Um, to the point of nausea, severe headaches, um, extreme constipation, can add weight, which can then add to other complications like hypertension, obesity, which then they may need to see a doctor for something like another, you know, a medical issue. And so you can see why a person might not be eager to, to take their medicine on a regular basis because it makes them physically feel poorly. Um, also, what you might find if you know someone who's struggled with a mental illness and they've been, you know, you've taught them into going to see someone take medication, what we find is they often stop their medications around the 90-day mark. People begin to feel better. And when they feel better, they feel like they don't need it anymore. You know, because it's not, the medicine doesn't make you feel happy. It just makes you feel like you can live and enjoy and function. And so then there's this sense of, well, maybe I don't really need it. And I would say to you in this room, how many of you have gone to the doctor because you had symptoms of strep or the flu and you got an antibiotic and you did not take all 10 days? <laughs> You did not, did you? Who did I? Because we might need it later, you know, if I start feeling bad, you know, kind of thing I might take it get me ahead of it. Or after the seventh day, I really feel a lot better. So I'm just not going to take it anymore because it upsets my stomach or makes me feel nauseous. So if we're talking about the flu, when we're talking about strep, we're talking about something that um, is sort of accepted <coughs> without stigma. So you can imagine how that might impact someone who is struggling with depression or bipolar disorder or schizophrenia. So if there's anything else I want to say before I talk a little bit more about schizophrenia. So schizophrenia, I think it's, uh, <coughs> has really gotten kind of a, a, a bad reputation in a sense because we see what the media does to portray individuals who uh, struggle or live with schizophrenia or psychotic symptoms. And again, schizophrenia is uh, impacts about 1% of the population. About 1%. And not that that's not a large number, because it is. But I think sometimes it is misleading. Also, I think the media will mislead in implying that individuals who um, have schizophrenia are violent, when in fact, that is not the case. When an individual who is schizophrenic becomes violent or um, anxious and begins to, um, you know, retaliate, it's generally because of paranoia or fear. They're afraid something's going to happen. They're afraid they're going to go back to the hospital. They're afraid they're going to go to jail. They're, they have a belief system. So, Basically, when a person has a diagnosis of schizophrenia, they experience hallucinations and delusions. Hallucinations such as seeing things that are not there, hearing things that other people don't hear. Um, they might have um, um, a, a difficult time with, um, let's, let's say, like wearing clothes that are appropriate to the weather. So you might see someone in the summer who's dressed for winter or vice versa. Um, I love what CIT does because it helps the law enforcement to be better prepared because if you can imagine someone is experiencing hallucinations and they're hearing a voice in their head and here comes law enforcement and they've got a, a radio on their shoulder making noise, that can be, that kind of set, makes them feel even more like this is not a safe person. And maybe the last person that they engaged with or at a hospital setting was not a pleasant environment because maybe there was a restraint that had to happen or something like that. So you never know what that person has, their experience was before their experience with you. I think that um, 
<clears throat> Folks who are diagnosed with schizophrenia, once again, this often happens later in life, usually somewhere between 16, 17, 18, and about 26. Does that surprise anyone that it is? It surprises me. Um, if you think about the things that happen in a person's life around 16, 17, 18, can you, can you give me some ideas about what those transitions in life might be? Can you shout them out? New stress. College. Driving. Stress. Driving. College. Military. Military. Work. First real job with some real responsibility. Relationships. 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 Pregnancy. Pregnancy. They might begin experimenting with alcohol or drugs. So they're putting that in their brain where their brain is not finished developing yet. We often find that when individuals are in maybe their first semester of college, they begin to struggle. And maybe the, um, the school, a counselor there or a parent will say, you know what, maybe it's too much to start with. Come on home. If you live at home for a while, we'll support you. I'm not against that at all. I think it's a parent's way of trying to figure out what's happening. What has happened here? Things were fine. They were different. Well, there could have been something before, but maybe it wasn't picked up on. But what, what we know is that something happens in the brain when those, those stresses you just mentioned didn't happen before when they were younger. And it, it, it prompts something that was dormant to happen. And um, it often is genetic, uh, but not all the time. So we have a program, um, and I think it's, it's a part of my Avita presentation, but I want to mention it because I might forget it, so I need to mention it now. <clears throat> and that is we have a program called Emerging Adults, and it specifically targets individuals between the age of 16 and 26. It specifically targets educating the families of individuals at that age so that they can maybe recognize uh, those things happening. And also we do, in each of our centers throughout the month, uh, uh, we have someone who comes and does something in the community, presents something to, and it might be on how to manage money and keep up with the checkbook. Um, they sponsor 5Ks. They provide education to families. They provide education to the individuals. It also, in some situations, not all counties, and I don't think Union is one for this particular part of the grant, but we can help financially. <coughs> so again, if an individual has a mental illness and they need something that is a barrier to them being successful, I'm going to give you some examples of what we have been able to do. We had an individual go to college but needed a laptop. We were able to buy a laptop. An individual who could not pass their driving test because they couldn't afford to get glasses. Pay for them to have an eye exam and to get their glasses. Uh, an individual whose family was unable to help uh, change out <coughs> bedding and they, they had bed bugs. And we were able to get a bedroom suit with, you know, get rid of that stuff and, and bring in something that was healthier and, and um, safer for them to live in. So that is a specific targeted population because we know that if we can't capture that population and help them to be successful early on and a part of their mental illness, we could lose them in a sense that they retreat. They just <clears throat> stay home. They don't pursue treatment. They don't know what's going on either in their bodies and in their mind. <coughs> when I talk about a delusion, I'll explain it like this. They, have a, they will have a belief system that doesn't maybe make sense to us. So if I was to say to you and ask you right now, and you can shout out, what color is the sky for the most part? Blue. Now, if I was to say to you, well, I know you see it as blue, and when you draw a picture, you color it as blue. And when you go outside, it's always been blue, but the truth is, it's actually purple, and everybody else in this room, except you, knows <coughs> that. And if I, we go outside now and I point to the sky, well, you see that it's purple, 
If we'll look together, everybody in this room except you sees it as purple. Could I convince you the sky is purple? Would you believe me if I just told you? No, that's a delusion. It's a belief system that means something to you that you see it, you hear it, you can feel it, and it doesn't matter that someone says, that did not happen. That is scary, I would imagine, especially to a young person when this is beginning to happen to them. So I wanted to explain what a delusion was so you would understand that as well. <clears throat> uh, sometimes there's disorganized thinking. There's often a belief system that is related to the government uh, or related to religion or related to something sexual. So we see that a lot where somebody will say, um, I believe that I am Jesus or my child is Jesus or my child is the devil and so therefore... Um, I need to protect my child and put that, puts the child in harm's way. Um, or the government, I believe that maybe someone has planted something in my home and everyone in here knows what I'm thinking. And then again, when you have a law enforcement person coming up with the radio and it's talking, it confirms for them sometimes you're getting messages, aren't you? You're getting, you're hearing something about me right now. They are telling you to arrest me, um, or worse. So um, these are the things that are important to keep in mind because folks are not going to be aggressive, scary, or, or violent unless they're afraid. If I'm afraid, I'm going to come out fighting. If you're afraid, you're, you, if you think about your child. If you're going to protect your child, you're going to come out fighting, whatever that looks like. So that's a way to better kind of understand what it's like to experience that. In the training that we do and that NAMI does, we actually have the law enforcement do an activity um, where they um, have someone kind of saying things to them while they're trying to carry on a conversation and how difficult it is to carry on a conversation because the truth is those conversations they're hearing in their head are not pleasant. They're telling them sometimes to kill themselves or, you know, you're, they're better off if you're not here, you know, kind of thing. So they're hearing, <coughs> hearing voices that are, um, that are self-deprecating and that are painful. And when you're hearing something that's painful, you're going to do whatever you can to stop it. Okay, let's see. I'm trying to, I know I'm sorry. Um, Lots of uh, medications, again, causing a lot of side effects that can be very uncomfortable uh, to the individual. A lot of weight gain, like serious weight gain is like steroid weight that you can't get off, and it can create other medical problems as well. Okay. Again, I could go over our pad jobs. So I'm going to let Francesca Smith talk now about substance use disorder. And then I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about what Avita does in this community for mental health and substance use disorder. All right. Thank you again for having us today. Um, it always excites me to be able to present um, about addiction disorders. Um, that is basically my first love is treating habits and alcoholics. I've been treating them since 1995 in some way, shape, or form. Um, so I'm glad to see there's a lot of people here that can take this information and share it out in the community because my biggest, my biggest passion is for people to help people break the stigma. Um, it is a brain disease just like depression, just like bipolar, just like schizophrenia. And a lot of people have that stigma where we see the stereotypical, we think of the bum on the streets. Well, that's not what addiction really is because addiction doesn't have any boundaries. Um, I've treated doctors, lawyers, nurses, police officers. I mean, you name it, it, it touches everybody. And I'm sure there's been plenty of people here who have been touched by the dynamics of addiction in some way, shape, or form. Um, so just along the way, just historically, addiction really didn't have a whole lot of treatment components to it. It was basically the old school where you kind of broke them down and built them back up. Um, and at one time, dealing with co-occurring, you didn't hear of that term at all. You either had a mental health disorder or you had an addiction. And you could only get treatment for one. 
and it didn't work out that way. So finally, in, I was thinking about the early 2000s is when co-occurring really came to the forefront and really built a foundation of how to treat addicts in a way that treats both dynamics at the same time. Because what you're going to see most of the time is a lot of addicts do have a mental health disorder. And if they did have a mental health disorder before they became addicted, they're more than likely going to have a mental health disorder after or in their recovery. And if you refer to AA or NA, they have even come a long way in accepting co-occurring and saying, okay, since you take a medication for your mental health, you're still welcome. Because at one time when I first got in the field, if you took a mental health medication and went to an AA or NA, they would say, see you later. So a lot has come to the forefront and a lot of research has been done in helping others break the stigma and to get more education on just the dynamics of addiction. And like Lori, I could go on forever talking about addiction and mental health. Um, so I try to wrap it in a nutshell, which is very hard to do um, because there's so much that goes into treating an addict and alcoholic. But I think for you, the biggest part is just learning what are some of the signs and symptoms. So the easiest way is just kind of looking at what is substance use disorder. So there's four different criteria that they look at in figuring out if a person has a substance use disorder. So the very first one is impaired control. So how many of you have felt out of control even when you're not drinking or you haven't used anything? We all have a tendency to feel a little bit out of control. But when you're in the midst of an addiction, you're looking at that person thinking, holy cow, what is going on? So pretty much, you know, they're taking it for longer than intended. And when I tell people, an addict doesn't start out saying, I'm going to use for years. They start out saying, I'm going to use just this one time. Because this one time, I learned a while ago that it did something to me that helped me just a little bit. So they plan on using it just that one time. And over a period of time, they keep coming back to it because of that reward system saying, I need this, or it helps me. Um, so you're trying to figure out why do they continue to do it? Well, they first find out it does something good for them. So through the course of addiction, it goes through many phases until it hits that moment of destruction. So, and what you'll see, and I'm sure you, some of you have probably heard this, is kind of the broken promises. They want to cut down or they want to stop, but they're not equipped. You know, they'll say, I'll stop tomorrow, or I'll just use a little bit. <clears throat> or you'll hear them say, well, okay, I'll stop using meth, and I'll just use alcohol. <coughs> because alcohol's not their problem. So what you see is they want to do something about it. When they get to a stage of change, which is the preparation, they, they know that they have a problem, they want to do something about it, they don't know what. Um, so the next one is spending a lot of time getting, using, and recovering from its effects. Once again, they only intend on using that one time. They don't intend on using it every day. So and there's kind of this joke amongst addicts is they're kind of like the <coughs> service. They'll get their drug come rain, snow, shine, sleep. So it doesn't matter what's going on around them. They're going to search it out. And they're going to spend their time using it. They're going to spend their time recovering. They're going to spend their time looking for it again. So it becomes this constant cycle, and unfortunately, it becomes a cycle for years for some. So and the last thing for impaired control is, is that they have cravings and urges. How many of you like chocolate? I know I do. That's a very innocent craving and urge to have, right? We can easily go to the grocery store, get a candy bar, and we're good. So, think of if it was a drug of choice. Chocolate's my drug, you can justify that. But when it comes down to a, a true addiction, dealing with alcohol and drugs, they crave it all the time, like you crave chocolate. They want to use it, you know, so they're impulse control. They're going to use it. I'll eat a candy bar every day. They want to use their drug every day. So, to them, it becomes this, this habit for them, and it becomes part of who they are. So the next one is their social impairment. So, and it, it kind of depends on the drug or how bold they get. 
So some kind of become reclusive, <coughs> some kind of, you know, they're wide open. But what you're going to see is they're not doing what they should be doing. You know, you'll see work starting to be affected, their home life being affected, their re relationships being affected. If they're in school, school's being affected. So you start seeing these little areas, you know, what was once important to them kind of goes on the back burner. So, say you're dealing with a teenager who is really into sports. You're going to see him, his grades are going to start dropping. <coughs> He's no longer going to go to practice. Friends start to change. So, his priorities kind of change. So, that is something that you're going to see um, once they really start getting into the depths of their addiction. Um, and then another thing that you're not going to understand is that they're continuing to use even when it's causing relationship problems. Because you think the whole part of addiction, part of it affects their cognitive abilities to make sound decisions. So they're going to make these broken promises, but to them, they think they're not going to catch on. So they kind of comes conniving, kind of cunning, you know, and, and the manipulation factor does go up. But to them, as, as Laura was talking about the delusions, that's their beliefs. You know, they start thinking, oh, they didn't know this last time. Well, you didn't say anything because you're starting to pick and choose your battles. You know, also, you know, they're going to they're gonna look at ways that they can get away with things. You know, and you're not understanding, but to them, it makes complete sense. You know, they start hiding their drugs everywhere. And they're not going to notice, or they're not going to tell you, but you're going to find these things, and they're just like, what? what in the world is going on? So, so that's part of the social impairment. Um, the next one is risky use. Um, so using substances over and over again, even if it causes danger. So we see a lot of habitual violators, you know, with drinking and driving. We see a lot of people doing some pretty dangerous stunts. <laughs> in the midst of their addiction. Um, you see just getting lost in their addiction, say they have something on the stove, they forget it's there. Falling asleep with a cigarette in their hand because of the pills they took. So they continue to do this over and over again. And to them, they're fully confident that it's not gonna happen again. And they're gonna tell you it's not gonna happen again. But they can't help but use again because of its craving and urges, just like the chocolate. So, um, the other thing is continued use, even if it is phys physically becoming destructive to them, is psychologically destructive. So, we've seen a lot of people in, if they make it to the late stage addiction, I consider them pretty lucky. But what happens in a late stage addiction is their body starts really taking a hit. Most people will die of their addiction in the very early stages because of accidents. So, if they make it to the point of late addiction where they're starting to have the physical problems, you know, they're going to continue to use because they've gotten to that point of they can't live without it. You know, think of something that you hold very precious near and dear that you won't live without. That's kind of what happens with addiction. Because you think of what happens when a person becomes addicted is the last part is they go through those withdrawals. You know, your body begins to depend on it and they don't see any other way to escape it other than to use something of the same drug or go to a different category to try and calm it down. Um, so you see a lot of tolerance. You know, you'll see a person start off maybe with just a couple drinks. You know, most people, it's socially acceptable to have a couple drinks. We're not going to think much about it, but eventually it builds over time. And what you're going to see is they're starting to use more and more over a period of time. Um, to the point to where they're having, they're building this tolerance. <coughs> what two beers once did, they need 24 to get. It. So, and it continues to build. And then you have the withdrawal factor that happens. And the easiest way to explain the withdrawal is always the opposite of the high. So, what brings you up is going to make you crash. You know, what made you really happy is going to make you miserable. So, and that's. Addiction in its nutshell, you know, it affects so many different people in so many different ways. Um, you know, and it, and it is a very baffling 
disease. Um, in the way that it affects the brain, you know, it all carries the same mechanism. You know, I could get into the brain chemistry and all that stuff because I'm a huge brain nerd. But the easiest way to, to explain how it affects the brain is in a very, I guess, layman's terms kind of scenario that I've, that I've put together over the years is how many of you are nature people? How many of you have watched the nature shows on TV? How many of you have seen them go into hives or to ant hills? You know, and you're seeing all the ants work really busy, right? <coughs> That's your brain. So you have all these, these chemicals going in your brain. Everything's firing the way it should be. You know, and it, it looks pretty darn cool, right? So how many of you have kids? Okay, and it's typically boys who do this, but they step on an anthill, right? They'll step on an anthill, and what happens? They scramble. So that's kind of what your brain does when you start drinking or using something. Your brain kind of gets excited. <coughs> and in those very beginning stages, like, okay, something's happening. You know, of course, the, the ants, they're not too happy about it. But it's, it's, it's my easiest way to give you the analogy of how the brain works with addiction. So over a period of time, and I've watched my son do this when he was little, step on an ant hill over and over and over again, Eventually, what's going to happen is the ants desert it. They find another place to go. So what essentially happens through the process of addiction is your brain has a very hard time taking up what it needs to do because it no longer knows what it should do. So some of the things have gone astray. So and when you're thinking about addiction in the brain, most of, most of the, the drugs and alcohol will target two to three chemicals in the brain. So you're looking at two to three chemicals that are saying, see you later, or they're just not wanting to do anything because they're like, why do anything? Because it's going to get stepped on. Meth, however, targets nine of the chemicals in the brain. So, and what I've learned about meth is it goes in a very specific order, and it comes back from the bottom up. So basically, the first thing that goes is their ability to care. Their last thing that comes back in their recovery is the ability to care. So, and that's typical of most addictions. The first thing that goes is the ability to give a care because they're depressed, they're anxious. Their last thing that comes back is their ability to care. And that's why it's so difficult sometimes to really get an addict or alcoholic to really realize the help that is there because they just don't care. And it's not that they don't want to, they want to. But the brain chemistry has taken that hit and you've stepped on that anthill over and over and over again. And it takes a while for the brain to bounce back from that. So a lot of times what we're looking at when we're treating the addict and alcoholic is the co-occurring disorders. You know, how much of this is from depression, anxiety, bipolar, schizophrenia? How much of it is part of the addiction? and looking at how can we work on both of those at the same time so that way they can come together at, at one time. So that way you can treat a person wholly versus just separately. So um, that's my, my saying on addiction. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to go through the PowerPoint. Um, it's, going to, it's going to bring it up. We're going to talk a little bit about what Avita does. Some of the slides, there's a whole bunch of them, and we're not going to go through all of them. I mean, I could, but um, you don't want to. So um, it, it talks about different governances and things like that that I've already talked about. So um, let's take a second. That's all right. That's okay. Avita Community Partners is the name of the organization. Our mission is to improve the quality of the lives of those we serve. This is just the um, kind of the progression of how it became. You know, back in the day, you may have heard of like mental health centers. 
Here we can add a mental health center. And that's kind of what we are, but we're a we have a legislature that's a little bit different that started in 93. This is our 13 counties. I do want to show this, though, because you can see we, we touched down here. Forsyth touches Fulton County. Hall County touches Gwinnett County. We um, touch South Carolina with Hartwell and North Carolina up here. We, we cover 3,400 square miles. There are 11 service sites, and I travel to all of those. Usually go to a different one every day the first three weeks of the month so that I can go to each of them. Where the stars are, are the, um, uh, those are the programs where we have developmental disability programs. So we have uh, mental health programs, substance abuse programs, and developmental disability programs. So the, for mental health or behavioral health, we serve the most in need, and we've talked about who they are, adults with developmental disabilities. These are just some pictures of our administrative office, which is located in Flowery Branch. We have a crisis stabilization unit that has 16 beds, very similar to what you guys have here. We serve individuals who are in a mental health or a substance abuse crisis, maybe needing detox. And they stay on an average, our length of stay is about four and a half, five days. The idea is the stabilization unit is the highest level of care we have, and then they get referred back to our outpatient centers. Uh, and in our outpatient centers, we do individual and group counseling. We have lots of group counseling for substance abuse, anger management, <coughs> skills building. We have an internal pharmacy where we can help with individuals who may not be able to afford medications or don't have other payer sources. Every site has an RN in it so that we do lots of, uh, we can give an injectable medication, we can provide a lot of services that are around whole health, the entire body, not just psychiatrically. Because many of our clients, remember, struggle with, mental, with physical health issues too, but they may not be able to afford to go to a doctor. Psychosocial rehabilitation, um, that's a big long word. Basically, it just means that we do um, um, skills training. We want to help individuals to learn how to live their lives more ind independently. So if a client says, I want to live on my own, then we might have a community support worker, and we got lots of words for it, but that person might work with them, they might get on the bus and ride the transit system, like in Gainesville we have a transit system, they might ride the, the bus with them so that they're comfortable riding it. They may go to the grocery store and walk up and down the aisles and talk about budgeting and then go with them to check out because we all have to check out at the grocery store. That's a life skill. We want to teach people how to live in the world. If you have to go to Walmart and return something, if you're too anxious or you don't know how to do that, you wouldn't do it. So we want to teach people to do that. We do have supported employment programs and can offer some housing assistance. We have a team called Assertive Community Treatment. It's a 10-member team that works completely in the community, including the psychiatrist, who works with the individuals who are at a high risk. It's only in certain counties. Um, they're the highest risk individuals, often homeless, multiple hospitalizations, multiple incarcerations. Their job is to serve them wherever they are. They might have the nurse go and, and give their medication under the bridge because they're homeless. These are the coming outpatient center. These are uh, uh, just different places where we have. We have a, uh, an arrangement through United Way with the senior center in Forsyth County where we provide um, groups for caregivers individuals who are caring for someone who uh, struggles with a mental illness or substance abuse. Med, we have a, a arrangement through MedLink in Forsyth County, which is um, um, this a behavioral, I mean, this is a medical office, so like they have a, the geriatrics in there, a pediatrician, their own pharmacy, their own lab, and they wanted to have a counselor to also provide mental health services. So they reached out to us, provided us a, an office, a suite, and one of our staff then works in their office so that if they have someone that's seeing a doctor right then and needs services, we make sure that we're available and we can serve them on the spot. We have three um, outpatient centers in Gainesville. We have an adult and a youth. We have That's the only, because it's so large, but Gainesville's so large, we have a youth services there that has its own um, center, its own staff, uh, own prescriber, and then a picture of the pharmacy there. 
We do have children's services in the school. We have some here in Union County and Towns County um, where we have a, a counselor that um, can serve kids in the school because many kids are unable, their parents are unable to get them to the office, right, to have services. So we can provide them in the schools. The schools have been super welcoming of this in this community. And we have specific child and adolescent, that's what CNA stands for, psychiatrists. We have a playroom, and that's a, some things that are painted on the wall. We use something called telemed, many of you may know what that is, or telehealth, and that is for our prescribers. So if we have a doctor that calls out sick, the individual client still comes to the office and they may see their another prescriber, but on the computer screen, so that there's no gap in their services. They don't you know, miss out on their medicines. They can still, it might not be the one they're used to seeing, but they can be seen uh, in that way. We have partnered with um, the Georgia Council on Substance Abuse. We don't provide the service, but we partner with them. CARES is a credential for adults who have gone through um, their own recovery, and it is, it's an acronym, and they go into the emergency departments where there's someone might be in an opioid withdrawal or crisis or overdose, and they are someone with lived experience, so they go and talk to them while they're there, help them know what to expect, what might be happening next, how to link them up with resources in the community, and we've offered them space to be able to do that. This is our substance abuse primary, primarily substance abuse. They can see mental health too. They also have a peer support program. Peer support is a program that's a day program for uh, individuals, adults who have a mental health disorder, and it is completely run, facilitated by other individuals with lived experience. So they work for us, they're in recovery, that they may struggle with bipolar themselves, but they're stable, they've gone through a program to be a certified peer specialist, and, and then individuals come to this program um, three, four, five times a week. The idea is to, is to for them to be, um, uh, they would talk about what do we need to know to be more independent? Do we need to hear from a nurse about smoking cessation? Do we need to know more about how we can reach out to community resources? And they do a lot of community work. And we also have a developmental disabilities program there. We have a supported apartment complex in Gainesville. Our substance abuse program is up to nine hours a week for individual and group. Uh, this is one of our uh, crisis apartments. We have a few crisis beds. So if a person is not in a stable situation and they're also maybe coming right out of the hospital and they don't have a a home, then it's across this apartment and we can have them temporarily live there for a few days. We partner with lots of accountability courts, drug court, mental health court, uh, parent, parent, parent accountability court, um, lots of, all of them, VA, there's a VA accountability court, and we participate in their staffings, we serve those <coughs> clients, those individuals, so that they can stay in their community. Family Treatment Court is a program, some counties have it, this one was in Gainesville, where they work with the, the moms who have mental health and drug abuse issues to, to get back into a relationship with their kids and with families. So they can come together and they like prepare a meal. And then they sit down together as a group, but with their kids, no electronics, doing better than I am, and then, and then they clean up together, they prepare the meal, what do they do together, how they interact together, teaching them how to reconnect with their kids. And their kids then, then afterwards there's a group where there's an adult group and a youth group. We have an adolescent substance abuse clubhouse in Gainesville, so for adolescents with substance abuse, and they do a lot of community work there as well. And then they have three different, uh, they call them pathways. We have a program called Women's Treatment Residential. It's women with drug abuse issues, and they are able to live in these apartments and have their kids with them, and there's so few of these in the state, and the kids can live with them there while they're in recovery. So it's pretty awesome. We've had several babies born where um, the moms came to us addicted, but we were able to work with them. They're in the program, and we have had 100% of the babies are born not drug addicted. Every one of them. 
So it talks about that. The 24 hours of 25 hours a week of treatment is minimum. Women and children together. They say up to six months. This is in Demarest, our outpatient center, and we have a developmental disabilities program. We have a partnership with um, Habersham Medical Center. They have uh, this group that got, I guess they've got through a grant um, called the team, and it's an uh, RN and a paramedic, and they drive around in their ambulance, and they have telemed, and they, they just go to see the clients where they are. They know the those individuals that many of us know that are kind of in the system a lot, but not stable, so they can go, and they actually are hooked up to our telemed equipment, <coughs> So if they need to see the doctor, they can sit in the ambulance right then and see our doctor so they can get a prescription or medication. And um, then they will, they might take them to their appointments. They might go pick up their medicines for them. That's all this team is designated to do. It's pretty cool. Another supported housing apartment uh, complex that we have in, uh, this one is actually in Demarest. We have something similar to that assertive community, like community-based program, but it's called community support teams. And it, we have two of those in, in our area. Again, it's all community-based. All the services um, occur outside the office because these are the clients that are not stable and they're not necessarily compliant with treatment. The Dreamweavers is a program of adult developmental disabilities uh, individuals, and they do so many things I couldn't begin to tell you. But they named themselves, and they are in the community. They are an active group and a force to be reckoned with. Uh, the Hartwell Center, we also have a developmental disabilities program, and that's where that's located, and Livonia. Uh, oh, let me say something quickly about Carry On Trailers. The reason this is here, they have partnered with us, and they will oftentimes hire some of our clients to help uh, them in the work that they do, and they are like the biggest advocates for our developmental disabilities, for the clients who have developmental disabilities. They often hire our individuals there. We have a mental health clubhouse in Raven County for little kids. So we have the Adolescent for Substance Abuse. This is mental health, and it's for individuals that are closer to like 8 to 12. It's kind of like an after-school program, but they just do all the fun stuff. They just do fun <laughs> stuff. And they also do fun stuff for the families, too, so that families can be a part of uh, doing things with their kids. And that just shows some of the fun stuff they get to do. Uh, zip lining. These are, these are clients, these, these kids would never have an opportunity to do anything like this without this program. And they don't have to pay for this program. TACOA, our outpatient center, developmental disabilities. We have partnerships with Home Depot, particularly in our Blairsville location. Home <coughs> Depot came and um, provided not only lots of supplies to build this whole area here, this was a mess. And they cleaned that up and they worked with our clients, our developmental disabilities clients, and um, with our staff and stayed and contributed and um, contributed financially, materially, and then actually did the work too to get that done. Participated in the scarecrow contest. And so here's our Blairsville location. And our Blairsville location is, is um, at Hunt Martin Road, right off the square, not far away. It's a small office, but we have, uh, <coughs> gosh, we've got new counselors now. Fran, Fran oversees the Blairsville office, Delonica in Cleveland. And so we have a psychiatrist, we have a nurse, we have two community support workers. They're out in the community all the time. We have a very active developmental disabilities program there. Um, we've had several CIT trainings, counselors. We have two school-based counselors now, and one, two, three that are solely office-based counselors. So it's a pretty large site, actually, as it compares to some of the others. We um, spon uh, not sp sponsor, but we are a part of Special Olympics when that occurs. Our Cleveland Outpatient Center, it's one of our smaller ones. Delonica, we have an outpatient center as well as developmental disabilities. This is an intensive treatment residential program for adults. We have four beds for individuals who are basically just coming out of a psychiatric hospital, but they've been there for a very long time. Some of the individuals have been in a state 
institution, state hospital for years, for years. And they are able to step down into, we call it ITR, intensive residential treatment, 24 hour staff there. But the idea is to help them transition back to the community when you have been in the hospital for years. That's in Dahlonega. Our Dawsonville office. We have an American Sign Language program, and we actually serve the entire state. Avita wanted to do this. It was put out there to other community service boards, and they didn't really want to touch it. We wanted to do it. So we have several um, counselors that are American Sign Language certified. Two of them, one of them right now, is actually deaf himself. The others are a fluent American Sign Language, and we serve the entire state. So we have clients that are in... Jessup, Georgia, for example. And they might do that through the telemed, or they might go there. Last week, he actually went there. It was an all-day thing, you know, because it's South Georgia. So, um, but it's to serve individuals who are deaf, uh, who need mental health services, because that population doesn't often reach out. There's not a lot of folks that can serve them. APEX is our counselors in school. I've talked about that. Um, advocacy, that's what that's about. Lots of services in the jails. We go into the jails and serve individuals there. The peer support, I mentioned that. The emerging adults, I mentioned earlier, 12 to 26. This talks about some of our individuals um, doing things that they have always wanted to be able to do. And quite honestly, these DD programs are pretty amazing. They are passionate about those that they serve, and they make sure they, they can do that. We have a total revenue last year somewhere around $26 million. Um, we are financially a, a strong community service board, are very careful about the how we manage our money. Some community service boards are not, and we're, we're very proud of ourselves for that. We take all payers. Um, we do not take Aetna. I think that's the one that we don't take. But we um, take Medicare, Medicaid. Uh, Marigrips and Patico, well care. We have a contract with the VA so that they will determine if that client can receive services in the community that they live in, and then they can do that here so they don't have to go to Atlanta or to the CBOP. And we value all of our partners, which are in this room. That was fascinating. <laughs>